This is BJ J Hood tapping into Jiu Jitsu lives on and off the mats. Hello, hello. We are back with the BJJ Hood podcast. I'm Babby, your host, and here with me today, Shay. Hi, I'm Shay. <laughs> Shay is our co host, and we're here to share with you inspirational stories about women in Jiu Jitsu and how the martial art changed their lives. You know that already. Um, don't forget, we are on YouTube with subtitles in Portuguese, so make sure you go ahead and follow us there so you can have access to the video of the interviews. Um, if you want to see our faces and a little bit um, how this goes and follow us also on Instagram so you can have access to all the news, all the new episodes that are coming out. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite uh, podcast platform. That way you also get notified every time we have a new episode coming out. Um, today we're here with a really special guest, Kate Egan. Um, she's a black belt. She just got her black belt in April of this year, 2023. She started jiu-jitsu in the end of 2014, like almost beginning of 2015. Um, she's an avid competitor, also referees for a lot of different federations. Hi, Katie. How are you? Hi. Thanks for having me today. Of course. Thank you for coming. Thank you for accepting talking to us today. Um, I will start letting you, I always start like that. So I want to let you introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit about your jiu-jitsu story, like how it started, who brought you to jiu-jitsu, um, and what made you stay, um, since 2014. Okay. Uh, so you already said, um, I'm Katie Egan. Um, I'm currently a black belt, which is still, uh, mind blowing to me. It's been like six months, but it's still a little mind blowing. Um, I started, um, in 2014, at the end of 2014, uh, kind of by chance, I didn't even know what jujitsu was, um, but I had just come out of a really abusive uh, relationship and I needed something, um, an outlet. And I had signed up for a Groupon uh, for a month long kickboxing class um, because I didn't want to ever feel like a victim again. So I signed up and I went in and I absolutely hated it. Um, it was terrible. And there was a jujitsu class going on afterwards. And I stuck around and watched that and was like, no, that's what I want to do. And so the next day they let me try that instead. And I never took another kickboxing class. So I just went over and did jujitsu and never went back. And now here I am a black belt uh, nine years later. That's awesome. What was, um, what, what did you love about it so much that like first try that made you like do the switch? I mean, obviously like you hated kickboxing, so that was probably a huge push, but, um, what was it that, uh, kind of drove you that first day to like stick with it? I think it was the fact that it, it's a very physical sport, but it's more than that. There's a lot of mental aspects to it. Um, I always call jujitsu kind of human chess. And I really have always enjoyed that aspect of it, that you can kind of think ahead or when you're beginning, you can see that whoever you're rolling with already knows how you're going to react and use it against you. That's awesome. Um, tell me more about that feeling. Like we we talk about that um, in jiu-jitsu, having all that mental aspect, that importance of jiu-jitsu to help you mentally. And you said about coming from an abus abusive relationship and having that victim um, feeling, right? Like, how did that, How did you feel at that time? And how did jiu-jitsu make you change that, like improve that feeling for something better? So I definitely... I uh, also love jiu-jitsu because it made me feel powerful and empowered and in control. And anyone that has been in an abusive relationship knows that it's about power and you get that taken away from you. So having something that empowers me and makes me feel like I'll never be a victim. I can take care of myself. It was so it was such a great feeling that that's a huge part of why I came back and it really helped my mental health. I'm a big advocate for mental health and um, see the therapist. You should jujitsu is not a replacement for that, but it can definitely help as you're going through things because when you're training and when you're rolling, it kind of shuts down all those voices outside and you're not worrying about everything that's going on outside of the mats. Yeah, that's what we talk about all the time, right? Like when you're training, 
there's no time for it. Like all your stress, all your problems that are all left outside. You are just so focused on trying to do that technique or trying to, I don't know, tap your partner or make something that you have been working on, work on the training time. And there's no time for you to think about anything else. And like you said, it's not replaceable for therapy, for example, but it's something that you can do that can clear your mind. And maybe you can go back home and like put yourself in a different spot now. And okay, now I know what I have to do or what I have to work on, you know, kind of like giving you directions maybe um, to something different, right? Exactly. With, um, with having that aspect of your past, right. And then going into jujitsu, I think one of, one of the biggest hurdles I have trying to get women into the sport is the close contact with people, you know, let it be female or male. Um, and a lot of times, like if they do have a partner, right. Getting their, their husband who isn't into the sport to kind of overcome that. So, uh, a person that has ha come from that type of background and like, not a trusting relationship and going into such like close quarters with an opposite sex um, and kind of putting yourself in a vulnerable area, right? Um, what do you, what would you say to the community of women that struggle with that or their husbands or their partners struggle with that? Because it's not like a natural thing for like adults to be so close and connected, you know what I mean, that are strangers. Um, so I, I will preface this by saying I'm not a doctor or a therapist or anything. So like my advice is just from my personal experience. Um, when I first started, um, being mounted was really triggering to me. I would have panic attacks. Um, and up until purple ball, it would actually still be kind of one of the tough positions. And I actually, my now husband, um, I spent an hour where he, it, it probably wasn't even an hour, but he would just put me in mount and he'd make me work through it and work through it and work through it. And I know that's not for everyone. And um, if, so, so if, if it's too much for you, like, don't listen to me, but that's how I kind of worked through that. It's really hard to be physically close in that really vulnerable position. And I just kept working through it. And I, you know, I haven't had, any panic attacks since then. I'm not saying that I'm cured or my PTSD is gone, um, but that's kind of how I went through that. I do think for um, when you're first starting out, I think the female only classes can really help you feel comfortable, especially those who come from um, sexual assault and abuse that might be more comfortable with women. Um, and obviously my example is really extreme where, where you're just like, you know, going over and over in that position, but it was someone that I really, really trusted. I knew would never hurt me. And it, and it was still very triggering and I just kept kept going for it. And I think it, it takes that kind of mental fortitude and you and and trying to work through it. And it's not going to be easy. I mean, there were times that as a white belt that I would have to, I remember there was a um, juvenile like blue belt, he had mounted me and um, he was bigger than me, but, but not by much. And I had a full blown panic attack. I had to get step off the mat and everything. Um, it's, it happens, uh, but you just have to find those reasons to keep coming back and finding partners in a gym environment that feels safe to you. I think you said like two things that are really important. It's like, one is look, know your own limits. Like, you know what you can do, maybe what, like how your professor did with you wouldn't work for somebody else. But if it's not, like if you're in a position in a jujitsu class, for example, it's like your first time or your first couple of weeks and you are still uncomfortable, like know your limits and, and express that too. Um, like find somebody that you feel comfortable to be like, hey, I'm not comfortable in this position, so I'm not going to do this position today until you're ready to like really move on. And it's like, Finding somebody in a place where you feel comfortable and that you can trust people. I think that's the most important thing because it's like, even though you you have all that anxiety on the situation that's going on, like bringing um, all of that from your past, like, you know, you are safe in that space and you know, you can trust those people. And I think that's one of the most important things, right? Like for the woman to, maybe you went to a gym and you didn't feel that comfortable, like just don't give up, go try to find somebody else or like some other place that you can feel comfortable and that they're going to help you to go through whatever you have to go through, right? 
Exactly. And, and being okay with your timeline, not being the same as everyone else's. I think we really get so focused on the belts and the journey and everything that we forget that everyone's training at their own rate. They're coming from their own background and it's okay to be on your own path. Yeah, we talk about, yeah. about this a lot of the times. People get to the gym and they're like, okay, how many years for me to get my black belt? <laughs> and I'm like, look, relax. Like, it could take seven years. It could take 10 years. It could take 20 years. It all depends. We don't know what's going to happen to you next month, what's going to happen in a year. I can never know. But um, and, and also the part of focus on yourself. Forget about, oh, my God, but Shay got her belt and I didn't. It's like... I, you guys are in different times. Just like relax, keep coming, keep doing your thing. Like it's going to get to your time. Just like keep consistent to it because you're going to get it, right? Um, I did. And in, in relation to what we were just talking about, um, I know like at the moment for me, like one of my big fears is being vulnerable like that and having something horrible happen. Um, and there was, you know, one point in time in my journey that I, I was like an aha, like light bulb, like this can save my life. This isn't just like, oh, I know karate or I know kickbox and I can, you know, beat you up. It was just like a moment of like, holy moly, like I could really protect myself against somebody that is drastically bigger than me. Um, did you ever have that type of moment um, in your journey to date, right? Maybe if it was early on or later on, there was like this one profound moment where you're like, I, I, I have what it takes to ensure my safety. I think um, I still have those moments sometimes when I go against like brand new white belts that are so much bigger than me. You know, I'm 110, 115 pounds. And I'm like training with these 250 pound guys that, out muscle me easily like they're much stronger than me and you're just like no I'm gonna yeah. do whatever I want and <laughs> I think that feeling is so amazing and um I don't think I got that until probably a three or four stripe blue belt because I was so small I feel like a lot of it I was you know th this I didn't have the skill yet to be like yeah I can take care of myself and then when I got to that point and I and I was like I can let you work and I'm still going to be just fine. And it, it's, it's really empowering to know that even though they have a hundred pounds on me, I'm like, Oh no, I can sweep you when I want to sweep you. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little bit here sometime, yeah. but when is the right time? I'm going to go for my, my thing. Like you can work a little bit, not too exactly. much. <laughs> yeah. My mind happened or like super early on, like uh, as a white belt, like I was, I did a very like, <clears throat> basic move and um jumped guard pulled down took the took the hills and swept the person that was uh, you know 120 pounds heavier than me it was like a full-grown man that was six two and it was like that moment i was like holy moly like what i was practicing in the gym is actually working right now like obviously it was a friendly encounter in a sense but it was kind of like oh you're doing jujitsu let me challenge you and it was somebody that actually was a blue belt, I think, like coming out of blue belt, going to the purple at the time. And he was caught off guard of, you know, my reaction time in a sense. You know what I mean? So um, for me, that was kind of like my aha moment of like, oh, wow, I could really, really get away from somebody if I needed to. It was cool. That's awesome. Um, Katie, tell me, I see we talked about this in the beginning. You were really an avid competitor. When was the time that it clicked for you for a competition? And like, why did you start that? Because if you were, I don't know if you did competitions as like a blue belt, as a white belt, but like, how did you manage the anxiety of like going into a competition and putting yourself out there with people that you haven't never seen in your life are not the people you trust from your gym? Like, do you remember that feeling and like what made you want to do that? Uh, so the first time I competed, I had been training for about three months. And the reason I competed, it was like an all women's tournament, which I thought was really cool. And I was the only woman at my gym. And so I was like, okay, like that would be such an awesome experience. I was like, um, I, I don't know how I'm going to do, but let me go out and, and support this great cause. Um, they donated their proceeds from it, I think to um, domestic abuse, if I remember, it, it was obviously like eight, nine years ago. And 
Um, so I went out there and I remember some of my teammates were like, hey, it's OK if you lose. It's your first tournament. It's not a big deal. Just go out and have fun. And I was like, excuse me? No, <laughs> I'm going to go win. I'm going to prove you guys all wrong. And then I did. I went and, and I wow. had three matches and I won. And I was like, yeah, I can do a lot more than I, I think I can. And I just started competing from there. I, I come from a background of athletics. Like I was a gymnast. I did high school sports. Um, I did sports in college. And so having this avenue, I was like, oh, no, th this is this is awesome. And it was also the first time I rolled with a woman and someone my size. So I started doing more tournaments to find people my size just to see where I was at. And then um, I pretty much haven't stopped competing since then. But as for the question about the mental aspect, I was a complete wreck when I first started competing. I couldn't eat the morning of. Like I was threw up in between matches because my nerves were so out of control and I had no way and no techniques to uh, handle them at all. Um, so it was actually when I uh, moved up, I started jujitsu in Texas and Dallas, and I now live in Seattle. And when I moved up here, um, my, my professor, uh, James Foster, is really big into mental training. Um, and so I started training my mind, not just the physical aspect. So I uh, read a lot of books, listened to a lot of podcasts, um, and started utilizing the techniques that I learned in these books to start to get my mind right for competing because you'll see it. I see it as a ref that someone comes out and they already look defeated. They haven't even started. And then nine times out of 10, they do lose because their head's not right. Um, so I, I put a huge aspect into my mental training. Like what are these books like that you would recommend for people that maybe are on that situation? Because I think it's normal for you to be nervous. That's one thing. Another thing, it's like when you get there and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to lose like that mental state that we were talking about that you can see in their eyes. Like, what are those books? Like, where would be podcasts that you would recommend for people that have the same feeling as you had when you were starting? Uh, so the two that come to mind are uh, 10 Minute Toughness and The Art of Mental Training. And I'm actually writing my own book about wow. uh, mental training for jujitsu specifically. Um, That's exciting. I don't know when it's going to be done, <laughs> but uh, eventually I would recommend my book too. Um, That's exciting. Some of the, the main things. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. It's just one of those projects that I need to really finish. Um, I mean, a lot of it is just putting a positive spin on things. Um, that, that positive mental attitude is really important. I hear a lot of people um, talk about being afraid of losing. And so they're ready setting themselves up for success or they're like, I'm really nervous. I feel sick. But physiologically, your body, nervousness and excitement feel the same. It's just the whether you're putting a positive or a negative connotation on it. So if you can just spin it a little bit, then it feels like a positive emotion rather than a negative one perspective to have because <clears throat> I'm one that like is completely defeated by the time I even step onto the mat so then that Babby seen it firsthand <laughs> <laughs> yeah I did see it um yeah it, and it's like I think it what you said it's it's cool because I I do feel sometimes like oh my god I'm so nervous I feel that I'm gonna throw up in some some competitions like if I spend a long time not competing and I go back into it that's how I feel normally but it's good to like hear that on like okay maybe next time I'll try to switch that up and be like I'm not nervous I'm just excited to be here like try to tell myself that I'm excited and it's gonna be awesome it's all that I want like I'm here because I want to be here and I want to do this and let's see what happens right I I, I that and then having like the two Really quick tips I give people is one, spinning the nervousness. Like you're going to feel that. It's just how you spin it. And two, having a mantra to just say in your head that helps calm you and center you. I am calm. I am collective. I am a champion. And I, I'll just say that over and over until I'm, until I can get my heart rate down or whatever is affecting me. And then it, it's just, I say it over and over and it'll change sometimes depending on what's going on, but it's always, I am calm. I am collected. I am a champion. 
That's awesome. Do you hear music before the matches too? Does that help you? Or you, some people like to hear, some people don't. They want to like hear the noise and like kind of get used to that. Like, what's your take on that? Uh, it honestly, it depends. Um, I, I compete so much that um, I only use music when I'm really feeling the nerve. So um, I just competed at uh, Nogi Brasileiro. So it was my first time competing in Brazil. And the energy at that tournament was different. And also, I'm still working on my Portuguese. So it, it just felt really different. So I actually did get nervous. And, um, and, and so I used music to help center me then. Um, but a lot of times I won't. It'll, it, it'll just kind of depend on how I'm feeling. But it's another tool that I can use to help get my mind off of the negative aspects of, of competing and just be more excited and aware and, and take in the moment. What was that, um, <clears throat> that energy that you, you felt in Brazil? It was just, it, I don't even know how to explain it. It was, it was intense. Like everyone was there and wanted to win, which is the same at every tournament. And I think I might've been putting a lot of external pressure on it. It wasn't even coming from it, but it just felt like a lot more intense than other tournaments. Um, I mean, it is a major Uh, Worlds feels like that too, but it was like a whole new level. And I think also not really knowing many people down there versus when I go to a tournament in the United States. Yeah. It's, it's the same people that I see. Yeah. I'm from Brazil and um, my, I, I didn't have the chance to compete on the Brazilians nationals before um, I started competing more on like bigger tournaments when I moved to the U S but my husband has been there and Everybody that I talk to, they have the same feeling. It's a different energy. Like, I don't know if it's because for the Brazilian people that like most of them cannot come and do like a Worlds, for example. So the Brasileiros feels like the Worlds for them. It's like it's one of the most important, the biggest tournaments that they have in the year. So it's the, kind of that same feeling, that tension from everybody. But at the same time, the excitement of being there and like, Getting to win is the, the biggest, is the most important for them. So um, that might be it too. Um, and tell me about um, your role as a referee. Like you've been on both sides. You were an athlete um, and you also referee. Like when did you start doing that and how did you get there? Like, because even today, we, I think we I see more women refereeing, but it's still not like a lot of women. Um, like What was the first thing that kind of pushed you to that, to do that? So I started refereeing shortly after getting my purple belt for more like local uh, tournaments, um, things like grappling industries, and then the few local ones that are only in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and a big part of that was I needed to make money in jujitsu. So I started full time as a four stripe blue belt. And even as a black belt, it's hard to make money in jujitsu um, unless you own your own academy. And even then it's a struggle. Uh, so I, I first started doing it because of that. And then I noticed that it actually made me a better competitor because I started learning the rules even more because I mean, everyone, I, I shouldn't say everyone because there's plenty of people who don't know, but most people should know how many points a pass is, what, what mount is, um, back mount, back control, all of those things. But there are a lot of nuances to the rules that I don't think people understand or recognize. Um, and then shortly after I got my brown belt, because to to ref for IBGF, you have to be a brown or black. Um, that's when I started doing it. And I started with IBGF, not necessarily to make money. It is a good way to make money, but also to represent women in jujitsu because um, I just had my first match with a female referee. Um, it was my finals in American Nationals this year. Before that, I've never had a female referee. And I think it's important, especially at the kid tournaments, that little girls can see both male and female referees and know that you can be in any aspect of this sport in the way you want. You can teach. You can compete you can referee, all of that is possible, whether you're a boy or a girl. How do you see today, like, does 
this change, I think there is a change that it's happening. I think there's more people. Um, I don't know if the, the women are trying more, like trying to live off of jujitsu. You said it's a struggle. A lot of people, they have like jujitsu more as a hobby, unless they're like athletes and they live from that. But it's still a struggle for a lot of people. Um, how do you see the scenario that is changing? Like we see some of the, the tournaments now, they're paying, they're paying good money to the athletes. Um, the sport is growing as a total. Like, how do you see that going forward? I see that I know you have a daughter too, and she also do jujitsu. Like, how do you think it's gonna be when she gets to her black belt on her twenties? I don't know. Um, the scenario for women in jujitsu. I definitely think it's gotten better. I think it's still really tough. I mean, you see big name female black belts charging less for seminars than some purple belt men, um, which I think is a shame. And I think um, part of that may be because we undersell ourselves, but I also think that a lot of gym owners may also think that women seminars can't sell. And I, I, I'm i really hoping that, I, I we already are kind of progressing from that, but I think it's been slower than I wish it were. Um, I, I, I do like the way that IBJJF pays uh, at Worlds based on the number of athletes in your division rather than male or female. So the sm the smaller male rooster weights, they have less competitors. They get paid the same as, as um, a female bracket of the same amount. I just, I, I don't know what we can do to help it except for just keep showing up and keep trying to do it. And I'm really hoping by the time my daughter becomes a black belt, as long as she wants to do this, that it's better for her because it's, it's hard to sell yourself and be like, come bring me in for a seminar. And I think that has a lot to do with myself and not feeling, well, I know I have a lot to teach and can give. It's hard to sell yourself. And, and I, I, I don't know what the, the solution is though. But I think what you said too, it's um, about like knowing how to sell yourself. It's a, a lot of your mental too, because I, I struggle with that a lot of the times on different stuff, not on seminars, because I don't teach seminars yet. But um, I want to sell something that I made. And then I'm like, but I don't know if anybody's going to pay that. So I'm already putting myself on that situation of like, nobody's going to want to pay that price for me. But that's the value of it. So you should like first believe in yourself. I got this. I, I know I can teach. You said that. I know I can teach. I have a lot to teach to people. So I think if we come to like the school owners and like start offering that on, hey, I know what I'm doing. Like, I'm sure I can give you guys a really great seminar on this. And this is my price. And like, and not let them tell you like, oh no, but I can't pay you like $500. I can only pay you 200. If you're like, okay, I'll get the 200. That's, I think that's the problem, right? Like you would be, oh no, I'm so sorry, but it's $500. Like that's it. You have to go with my price. So I'm not, I'm not coming. And just like reach out to as many people as you can, because I think that that would be the only way it's like putting ourselves out there and kind of like pushing ourselves into it and making people understand like, okay, now I, I think we have, and having more women's and school too, it's, I think that helps too. Like I want to have women's coming and teaching seminars at my school. And I tell that to my professor all the time. I'm like, we should bring this person. This person is amazing. Like, let's try to bring this one here. Like I'm the one all the time poking him with women's names that he should bring to our school. If we lied to them, maybe they would be the ones that are going to be just thinking about the guys they want to learn from. Right. So I think it's our job as students too to kind of like do that part of like ask for that too. Yeah, and and on top of that, I think kind of nagging on the promoters to have more female uh, professional fights and to actually pay the athletes to come out and do it. I think that's the I think one of the hardest parts about doing pro fights is a lot of the organizations want you to pay your own way, pay for everything, and then you might have a chance to win some money versus in other professional, like in MMA, you get paid to just show up mm -hmm. and, and we're putting our body on the line and the promoters don't want to pay us for that. 
and that that goes men and women and i uh-huh. i think that should change yeah i think it's our mentality as as the people that want to watch too a lot of the times we don't want to pay like oh i don't want to pay like 15 bucks to watch this fight like no that's what's going to pay the athlete if you want to support the athlete like you have to pay you have to pay the entrance you have to pay to watch it online like especially i i, I see that here too but like we're always trying to find a way oh no i'm going to see if i can watch from this guy that is there and it's posted on instagram for free on the live it's like no that way you're not supporting the athlete there's no way the promoter is going to pay them because they're not making money from it too right so I think it, it is like one part of promoters on like doing their job on paying the athletes and understanding that this is your like the way that you live from. Like that's the money that you make to pay your rent, to pay your bills. So you have to make money. You can't go there just for fun. Um and on the other side, as as the spectators and the like jujitsu people, like let's support that and let's let's pay to watch those people too. Or maybe one day for me, if I get to that point where they're inviting me, or I don't know if I'm a school owner for my athletes to go there, like I, it's me helping too. It's me like paving the way to that, you know? Um, I think it's everybody's problem, let's say like that. Like everybody has to do their own little part on it. Um, Katie, tell me about the woman who wrote, like when did you decide to start that project and what was your idea? on doing that and where you are right now with it? Uh, so I started Women Roll actually as a white belt um, because like I mentioned previously, I was the only female at my gym. Um, I didn't actually have uh, consistent female training partners until I was a four-stripe blue belt and I moved up to Seattle. Um, and I love seeing the growth of women's jujitsu jitsu that, that has happened in the last eight, nine years. But that's where that started. I wanted to showcase women's jujitsu and show other people that, hey, you could do this too. Look at everything that you could accomplish that I'm accomplishing. Um, It started off as a as a blog and I have written a lot of articles and done interviews and that kind of stuff. Um, Eventually, maybe a podcast. I want to make it uh, some kind of. scholarship to help have more competitors or if they need geese or they need help paying the gym fees just because I understand I started jujitsu as a single mom and it is expensive and my first professor Alex Martins really worked with me because I couldn't afford the price of the gym but he was willing to work with me because so I, I helped out around the gym and he gave me a discounted rate. But if he hadn't done that, I w- might not be here today. And so I want to have those kind of programs or something that can help women that really need it so that we can continue to grow women's jujitsu so we can have more um, female competitors because the divisions are so small. Um, and so hopefully in the future, when I'm less busy, it can grow into something more than what it is now. That's what I was going to ask, like what it's missing for you, from you, for you to get to that point. I was talking to she um, before the interview and I was telling her that I love that idea of trying to support women somehow. And I told her, I'm like, I hope our podcast gets to a point where we can do that too. Um, like have sponsorships maybe that could give uniforms for people that cannot afford that, or even like memberships for people that cannot afford Um and that that would be the question, like, it's just because you're busy right now and you can really put into the work. Like, do you have people that you would go for right now that you think that would help or you would have to, like, kind of try to still find those people that would um, help you out with that? Um, I I think I have a um, enough um, connections and stuff that I could do it now. It's just the time um, because I just got my black belt six months ago. Um, I'm 31 and I want to make a run at adult black belt as long as I can. So right now my focus really is um, on myself and my, my competition. And so it's just more the time that I would need to commit to do something like that. It's what, what it deserves. And right now I just don't have that. How many um, in your studio currently right now, do you have a lot of women in there and um, seasoned women? 
Um, and do you see like um, a lot of women coming, but then not um, sustaining and staying and going through the journey? We actually have an incredible women's class. It's, it is very rare that I'm the only woman on the mat. Actually, we typically have a lot of women. Uh, we have white to black belt. We have three black belts. Um, we actually have the uh, 13th American black belt, uh, Michelle Wagner, and then we have myself and, and one other. And then we have blue belts, purple belts, brown belts. Um, and I know how lucky I am to be at this gym to have that um, because I will go visit and I'll roll with the white belt or blue belt women. And they're like, I've never gotten to roll with a black belt before. Um, so I, I feel so privileged to have that. We have such a great women's group. Um, and, but I don't think that my academy really is a good representation for all because there's so many that don't have that. I mean, there's areas that don't even have female black belts. What uh, what is it about your like dojo that attracts women and gets them to stay and have that good like representation, um, for the sport? I think that having upper belt women and women that we are teaching classes or um, solo teaching classes, assisting teaching classes, I think that will bring in more women. When you have women in um, positions of power, it it kind of helps promote the gym as a female friendly gym. I think that if if you have the ability to have a female instructor and you don't, that's really a shame, and you're not helping your women's yeah. program grow. I agree. Yeah, that's that would be yeah that would be my other question too. Like, do you, how important do you think it is to have that women's only class? Like on our gym, we started that um, I don't know maybe like two years ago or so, and I see that helped a lot. Like at at least for the first step of the girls on like getting into it and feeling comfortable with it, and then coming to uh, mixed classes and even maybe just working with girls on that if they want to but like that first step of uh, getting to the class it helped a lot do you think that that would be like a good start at least for the schools and having a woman teach that class too um i think um if you're going to have women only classes it should be taught by a female instructor it shouldn't be taught by a male instructor i think allowing them to have that space to talk about things that don't affect men, like competing on our period or dealing with a period while training, all, all these different things that men don't have to even think about. Um, like the hormonal aspect of cutting weight is different as a female than a male. Um, and, and so if you are going to have female only classes, it should be a female instructor. Um, but I also think that if you don't have the ability to put that in your schedule, you can still be a female friendly academy just based on the environment that you're creating. And that's making sure that all your students, not, not just women, but know that they can always say no to any role that, um, they, that not every role has to be Mundial's, the finals, um, that, not everyone is there to be a world-class athlete. Some people are there because they love jujitsu and they just want to learn jujitsu and, and understand that, that creating that environment that cr lets jujitsu be for everyone also helps it be for women. Yeah. In our studio, um, I think one of the things that they do in the mixed classes that I, I love actually is they give, they they open it up the same pick your partners, but they say, women, please pick your partner. So we have an option to go and pick the, the other female that's in the class or somebody maybe at your stature. And so we have first dibs um, on who you're going to pick for your partner that that round. So it, I think that helps. If you're new to and your professor, like helping you picking the partners for you, because as a professor, you know who are the good partners, especially for female, like, you know, who's going to be a nice one you know, who might not be the good one. So like doing that part of helping out until they feel comfortable and they know everybody, that's really important too. Whenever we have um, a female athlete like come and uh, guest uh, and drop in, I always try to pair them up with um, the safe roles and not necessarily that other people are unsafe, but just that 
I know that it'll be matched a little bit better and they'll get a better role from this person versus going against the 250 pound wrestler. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's important too. Like some people would think like, Oh, if this person's not safe, like why would you keep them on at your gym? And it's like, it might not be safe for you right now, but it's a safe person. It's just because for you, it would yeah. be better to have a different match. So a 250 pound white belt may not be the best for 120 pound blue belt, but they're a great match for that 200 pound purple belt. Yes. Yes. They can give them a, a hard time. Not, not me. I don't want a 200 pound, <laughs> 200 pound white belt at any time. Um, Katie, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, I like to finish it asking if you have any message for the girls out there that haven't started jujitsu that might be looking into it, but don't feel they're ready. Like, what would you tell them? Or even people that have been training, but for some reason their life got into the way and they're kind of like giving up a little, what would be your message for them? So for the women that don't feel ready, I would say that if you wait until you feel ready, you're never going to feel ready. Um, I am very much a jump off the deep end. Try it. You are capable of so much more than you know, and you'll never know what you can accomplish if you don't try. And then for the women that are kind of struggling and are having a hard time, I would just say that you take it day by day, just show up and amazing things can happen when you don't give up and giving up on yourself is never the option. So just show up, have focus on the little victories that you have every day. And all of a sudden it'll be nine years later and you'll be a black belt. That's awesome. Katie, thank you so much again. Um, make sure that when you drop that book, you let us know because we yes. want to have you again to talk about it. I want to know more what you're bringing on it. So it would be awesome to have you. I will. And thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Thank you. For you that is listening to this episode, make sure you share with your friends, um, share on your social media so we can get to more people. They can hear a little more about Katie's stories. Um, if you want to have her on your gym, please reach out to her. Let's have women at your gym teaching seminars. She's amazing, really good competitor. Um, like she said, she can teach you guys a lot of things. And make sure you also follow us on Instagram, on YouTube. We have subtitles on YouTube in Portuguese. Um, and if the interview is in Portuguese, we're going to have English subtitles there. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thanks for listening. Would you like to share your story? Email us at bjjhoodpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at bjjhoodpodcast.